And I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting today and on which we're all working today from all across the various regions of Victoria and Australia. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. So welcome, welcome to this forum, the Alcohol and Other Drug Nurse Practitioners in Matod Service Delivery in Regional and Rural Victoria. It is a bit of a mouthful, but welcome. On this forum's purpose is to showcase the findings of research undertaken by Monash University and Ballarat Community Health. And the research investigated the facilitators and, facilitators and barriers of the rural and regional Victorian matter prescribing AOD nurse practitioner workforce and explored their professional perspectives and contributions to the Victorian Matod service system. And we would like to acknowledge the support of Orticare. Orticare is the pharmacotherapy network covering the Grampians, Loddon, Mali regions, led by Pauline Malloy, whose lead agency is Ballarat Community Health. We'd like to acknowledge the School of Primary and Allied Health at Monash University for also for funding this project. Now, just a word on terminology. When we say MATOD, MATOD refers to medication-assisted treatment of opioid dependence. It's otherwise known as opioid pharmacotherapy, opioid replacement therapy, or opioid agonist therapy. And it involves the use of buprenorphine and methadone, liquid methadone, to treat opioid dependence. So the running order of the days, firstly, we're going to hear from Dr. Tejaswini Patel from Monash University. She's a senior lecturer and chief investigator of this research. And then following on, we will call our panel members to join us for a discussion on, on that research. So in particular, the learnings from the research and recommendations for policy and practice, and for a discussion on the current trends in the AOD nurse practitioner workforce and that of service system. And finally, for their suggestions uh, regarding increasing the AOD nurse practitioner footprint within the MATOD service provision. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, all participants, if you could ensure your microphones are muted. And panelists, if you could ensure that you're ready to switch off your microphones when you come onto the panel. Um, and that includes, that includes cameras as well for the uh, panelists. And for participants, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat box and a Q&A. So I'd prefer if the chat went into the chat and the questions went into the Q&A. That allows us to keep track of the questions. OK, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Teja Sweeney Patil. She is a senior lecturer in social work at Monash University in the School of Primary and Allied Healthcare, Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences. She has undertaken research documenting the lived experience of MATOD, opioid pharmacotherapy consumers in, re in regional and rural settings. She is undertaking research to understand workforce gaps in opioid pharmacotherapy service provision and has established strong and ongoing partnerships with key industry partners, including pharmacotherapy area-based networks, the PABINs, and peak bodies, including uh, um, the Orticare system, the Orticare uh, PABIN. And talking about the Orticare PABIN, Pauline Malloy. Pauline Malloy is the manager of Orticare uh, at Grampians London Mallee. Pauline has spent the bulk of her career working in the community pharmacy setting. This includes work in several metal dispensing pharmacies with programs ranging in size from five to 100 participants. And during this time, she developed a great interest in the treatment journey for this patient cohort. Pauline completed her master's in public health and moved to the role of harm reduction coordinator at Ballarat Community Health in 2016, and then on to manager of the Grampians London Mali Pharmacotherapy Area Space Network, otherwise known as Orticare. And that happened in 2018. So Pauline is a strong advocate for Matod and is a strong advocate for improving access to this treatment, especially for clients in regional and rural areas of Victoria. So I'm going to hand over now to Teja Sweeney uh, to present her findings and, for, and to Pauline for her additional comments. Over to you, ladies. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Virgil. Uh, let me just share the screen. Uh, 
uh, give me a second. I'm not sure if uh, folks can have, do they have a full visual of the slide? Excellent. So just before I acknowledge my team, I just want to acknowledge the Bunurong and the Boranjari peoples of the Kulin nations, uh, who are the traditional owners and the custodians on the land in, on which we meet today, and also pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also the site of this uh, study. Uh, just uh, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, I've just run into trouble with my slides. Uh, I just want to just go to this main screen first. So really, I just want to acknowledge the researchers here. Aaron, um, Aaron's here, I can see him. Uh, Suzanne, Niels, Jana, Fergal, Pauline, Brenda, and very recently, Jess, who is on board. So thank you, everyone. Uh, before I actually, uh, I know uh, Fergal's already acknowledged the funders, but I also want to actually just make some uh, speci speci uh, specific mentions and shout out. I want to actually uh, thank the generosity and the commitment of the nurse practitioner folk who participated in this study because of their in-depth comprehensive perspective to uh, uh, in discussing their role we were able to develop very richly textured in-depth themes and potential uh, recommendations for the future so thank you everyone and also to the folks in the regional rural areas, the pharmacotherapy area based uh, networks. Uh, Pauline, um, uh, who is one of the co-funders of this project, uh, Tim from Gippsland and Hume, uh, Elizabeth and from South Bowen, Cindy. Thank you folks for helping us with the uh, participants and recruiting nurse practitioner folk for this study. So now let me just jump into uh, the uh, research itself. Uh, I'm having some challenges with my screen, so I think now I'm okay. Okay, so why this project? Well, we clearly know there is a well-documented shortage of prescribers of method treatments in community-based settings. This is across the board in Australia and internationally. And currently in Victoria, 2019 to 2022, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Studies, there is a 35% decrease in AOD workforce shortage and also at the same time, simultaneously a 5% increase in people who are impacted and or diagnosed with um, opioid or substance dependence. Uh, the literature, this is across the board, national and cross national studies, uh, um, hypothecate a number of, or I should say document a number of barriers. This includes negative perceptions of method consumers, provider stigma, legislative barriers in terms of requirements, scope of practice regulations, the restrictive natures, particularly in the United States, um, financial reimbursement and incentivization insufficient training and education. So clearly there is well documented across the board about the barriers. And also as we start to see, particularly in the last 10 plus years or so, you've seen a significant growth and interest, both from a policy sense, but also in terms of the literature about the role uh, AOD nurse practitioner for can play in the context of method treatments. And that's the significant literature in the United States, also emerging literature in the United Kingdom and Australia. In fact, one of our panel members, Sabri, uh, Adam Sabri will actually, are one of the few researchers who focus in Dana, focus on the AOD nurse practitioner folk in Australia. However, in terms of understanding the contribution of nurse practitioner folk in the real in the rural and regional areas in Victoria, much of 
the evidence or the knowledge is either anecdotal or fragmented. I've had a number of discussions with Pauline about the gaps in this, and this project evolved as a bottom of project to try and address this knowledge gap, if you like, and develop a comprehensive understanding of the facilitators and the barriers to the successful adaption and scale up of nurse practitioners in regional and rural Victoria. Uh, and uh, hence the main, the primary aim of this project is essentially to identify the enablers and barriers of method accredited nurse practitioner folk in regional and rural Victoria to service provision. But as I said, one of the interesting things you will see in terms of looking at the nurse practitioner literature, particularly with an AOD and a method focus, we wanted to see and scope the existing literature uh, and find out what's out there, both at an international level, nationally, and also at the state level. Hence, we undertook a scoping review. And uh, as you can see, the main research question is around understanding the facilitators and barriers to the professional role of uh, method prescribing among nurse, AOD nurse practitioners in regional and rural uh, areas. Now, in terms of the study design, hence, you will see a varied study design. We uh, had a scoping review which looked at both Australian and international literature uh, and uh, after having undertaken the school, um, doing the database search, um, uh, we were able to identify 16 um, peer-reviewed uh, um, journal articles and interestingly uh, all of them form, were from, sorry, uh, uh, 15 of them four were from the United States and one was from Canada and that particularly the Canadian one had a regional and a rural uh, focus. Um, and what we did was we presented this data to um, through a focus group. Uh, we set up a focus group interview with mainly GPs practicing in Victoria to discuss the implications and the findings of the existing research. We also undertook an exploratory survey of method prescribing nurse practitioners and the community health staff in regional rural Victoria. We had around 32 uh, open-ended and more uh, demographic employment education related questions um, as well uh, and 18 of them filled the survey. But today's finding and the focus of today's presentation is the in-depth qualitative interviews with method prescribing nurse practitioner folk, which we will report on. Um, and in terms of the analysis and the lens we took to the in-depth qualitative interviews, it was interpretivist research framework. And I will put this very loosely and very simply, and I'm sure my uh, colleagues from Monash might take um, might challenge me on that, but that would be good for the question and answer session. But simply put, an interpretivist framework understands and assumes that knowledge is situated in in the social context and people understand phenomenon within the social context. So for us, it was important to take this lens so we could understand how nurse practitioner folk working in regional and rural areas conceptualized and understood their role in pharmacotherapy delivery. And the final part of our methods was qualitative interviews with Victorian University coach directors and these programs, the Master of Advanced Nurse Practitioner degree was um, approved by APRA. Uh, and there are three universities, Monash, uh, Latrobe and Melbourne Uni. Now, as I said today, the focus of today's presentation is a study participants profile. Yana and Maya, Yana work very closely with all the three regional pharmacotherapy area based networks in Victoria and there. Um, <clears throat> and we were able to identify 25 accredited method nurse practitioners involved in pharmacotherapy delivery. And out of the 25, we were able to recruit 11 and 10 are currently prescribing 
three were men, eight were women, seven of the 11 participants reported their age and they were ranged in an age group of 34 to 61. In terms of the professional settings, just like the fraction of employment, we have varied uh, settings uh, uh, reported there two in community health practice settings, five in public health, both inpatient and outpatient, two in private practice, one in a GP practice, which is part of a consortium, and one in a public funded mental health service. In terms of fraction of employment, again, there is variability. One participant is yet to start prescribing, one is in a 4.4 role, one in 0.6, three in 0.2 FTE and 5 in 1 FTE. And when we asked about the employment pathway, overwhelmingly participants transition from roles in mental health nursing, AOD withdrawal, resi care, counseling, dual diagnosis, uh, psychiatric nursing, etc. So you will see that there is very significant uh, um, similarity in terms of um, particularly nurse practitioners with, with working in mental health roles having a interest in AOD. Now, as I uh, discussed previously, the lens we had was interpretivist. And when we looked at the data, we developed patterns or themes. Six themes were articulated uh, within, the, um, um, uh, um, uh, within the interview. And I have to say, as a researcher, uh, listening to the interviews, most of these interviews went for 40 to 40, 45 or 50 minutes. So clearly nurse practitioners provided very detailed and comprehensive answers. And from that patterns were developed. So let's, stick, let's talk about theme one. Simply the question was put, why AOD nurse practitioner? Why did you choose? And I think what we see there is the words which were used to answer that question were around passion, commitment, support clients in need. And I think what is quite Im interesting and important to recognize is that many of the people who we interviewed have had 10 plus years of experience working in the field itself of mental health nursing, AOD, psychiatric nursing, or some cognate field. And they were able to understand and capture the system level gaps there are for folks who have been diagnosed and or impacted with substance dependence. And you can see in those quotes, they wanting to make a positive impact in reducing using their these gaps so the motivation being many people with mental health conditions also have substance use issues uh, so obviously thought that time could he identify several gaps in the system so clearly their work experience has allowed them to develop why they want to do this work uh, interestingly, the second thing, practice frameworks of method AOD nurse practitioners. What is quite interesting is we actually did not ask about, we, our simple question was just describe your work and your day, how does it look? And what was really fascinating was the enduring and the overwhelming nature in the way nurse practitioner folk described their philosophy in how they approach their work with um, clients and what came through within that uh, narratives was client-centered, holistic, recognizing and acknowledging uh, and infusing the humaneness of people in our practice, social justice uh, uh, and integrated and collaborative care. And these are two examples, the quotes here, but that was one of the fascinating things which emerged was just when people were asked, they described their practice framework. And it is uh, also good to see that the practice framework, which each of these individuals in the participant group described, sit and align very closely with the Department of Health's Victorian IOD principles also. Another part, which was a very 
a strong theme, but also goes back to the philosophy of nursing also and its own origins is advocacy. And um, at least we had many of them actually talked about and recognized not only stigma in terms of other professionals towards method clients, but also how much advocacy they had to do within the organization to get pharmacotherapy treatment in their settings. So it was about reshaping organizational attitudes and getting this treatment and this service for the client. So clearly advocacy is also emerging as a strong principle that imbues the work of nurse practitioner folk whom we spoke to. And the third theme is around impact on clients. And this question was primarily, how do you see what were some of the challenges and um, what were some of the enablers of the work you conducted? When we asked that, they, the picture there is mixed, not surprisingly, because in this theme, we see many of them speak about the positive impacts the treatment had on their clients. For example, they talked about the pharmacotherapy, the pharmacotherapy treatment actually stabilizing people's lives, um, also allowing people who had been disconnected or um, not, had their children removed from their families being able to be reconnected, also getting jobs, having stable housing, etc. So some of the quotes which were also was about stabilizing on their pharmacotherapy treatment, but also transforming the lives of people. And what's interesting when we look at the positive impact on clients is the connection between the importance of pharmacotherapy treatment, but also the psychosocial supports, because they talked about the challenges clients had in terms of their complex social needs, whether it is housing, whether it is jobs, employment, education, so on and so forth. So it's quite interesting to see the impact both from a pharmacotherapy and a psychosocial point of view. And then the other uh, uh, impacts they talked about was from the perspective of clients and what clients reported to them were barriers. Clearly, working in regional and rural areas, they talked about having many of the clients who were active on their list and or their own observations was that they found it very hard to find prescribers locally. And also on average, they were traveling long distances, particularly 50 kilometers, somewhere uh, approximately from 50 to 150 kilometers range. So these were some of the challenges they felt, the nurse practitioner folk felt for clients. That's theme three. And theme four, professional support. So when we talked about the current uh, information resources and support, how did nurse practitioners feel about that overwhelmingly they said that the information the resources the supports the training which is provided by the department of health the education and the resources and the advocacy provided by the pharmacotherapy area based networks was a positive. They also talked about highly productive and valuable connections they have with addiction medicine specialists as well as their colleagues, other nurse practitioners who they relied on if they had challenging clients or challenging places or they needed to discuss a professional matter. I think the key thing to remember here what really struck me in reading the transcripts and listening to the interviews was the fact that despite the fact that these resources were there, they were very proactive. They took the initiative. They were committed because they wanted to ensure that, you know, they uh, provided themselves with all the evidence and the knowledge base and take the extra steps to make the networks with people. So clearly their own initiative, their proactive um, uh, in seeking, their proactive um, approach in seeking 
professional networks, collaborations, uh, seeking advice and mentoring from other um, uh, professionals, health professionals, combined with the resources and the support from the parents was quite um, useful for them in being professionally well supported from the perspective of knowledge and resources. Now, in terms of theme five, professional barriers for method prescribing nurse practitioners. Now, what I have done with the theme five and theme six, theme six is systemic barriers. We have just divided these two themes as professional barriers and systemic barriers. And there is a reason because we did ask the question, what are some of the, <clears throat> what, are, what are some of the enablers and the barriers to your work? And also what are some of the system level barriers to undertaking pharmacotherapy treatment. So hence, because of those questions, we were able to identify two uh, teams. In terms of professional barriers, I will talk about how nurse practitioner folk reflected on the day-to-day -day job and how there were a number of barriers there. Particularly one of the challenges they had is um, planning for leave, annual leave or any other type of leave. And I think the the quote there, before I go on leave, I have to do like an Iron Man experience to make sure everyone's all right. I think it's a profound insight into the challenges they, uh, uh, in, into the challenges both nurse practitioner folks uh, um, uh, face, but also the method clients because they uh, there is also risk of method clients not getting ongoing uh, and continuing care until they are uh, back. That's one of the things which came up. The other thing which came up was again, large distances and also the lack of other allied health professionals to assist uh, mentor clients, particularly in their own regions and rural areas in which they were living. For example, getting access to a pharmacist in the space where they were locally living was also another uh, challenge. And the other interesting part, which was reported as part of the role is, as I noted, nurse practitioners reported having an active participant leave rate ranging from somewhere between 20 to 150 plus clients. But much of the administration and much of the day-to-day -day tasks had to be managed by, um, by them on their own. And this meant that there was also a high burnout rate. And plus, of course, the fact that, you know, uh, additional planning, planning of leave, et cetera, also added to challenges in terms of their health and well-being. So that's another thing which practitioners reported on. Um, and I think the other broader point which I talked about in terms of the motivations why nurse practitioners came is they also, uh, the advocacy they had to continuously do because at this point yet, and what does a AOD nurse practitioner undertaking method or delivering method treatments to that's not well understood within the organization and they felt that there was greater need to understand the role um, the type of clinical expertise um, uh, etc uh, AOD nurse practitioners in particular bring so this was uh, they also felt that that was one of the challenges they faced. Now, in terms of the system level, which would be societal, policy, legislative, the whole raft of uh, system level barriers, they felt that the one of the things which comes. Now, this is no new news to anyone or who is listening to this study here today. However, it does validate some of the um, specific challenges we have. And I'm sure the forum group will discuss this in greater detail. One is the, uh, this, the quality of uh, care from a regional and a metropolitan perspective. So the regional, rural, I don't want to call it divide, but essentially the regional, rural, urban, metropolitan um, geographical area does matter in terms of access and also the type of 
uh, healthcare uh, and, and the type of access made or clients get in terms of their healthcare. So that's one part of the system puzzle. Then their funding. And as I noted to you, and I think this to me is was quite extraordinary in terms of how nurse practitioners explained they had to develop business management skills so they could then develop funding proposals, business cases, cost benefit analysis to, to not only rational to, to, to put these proposals forward to management because funding was not ongoing. It was much more short term and it was usually based or subject to renewal. So funding and ongoing funding was one of the challenges which was uh, Um, I'm sorry, folks, I have a feeling there's a fire alarm or something happening, but that's just occupational hazard. So anyway, um, uh, that does not stop me. I don't think we are being asked to evacuate just so from a safety perspective, folks can be fine with it. Don't worry. Uh, so I'll make one more final point about this slide. And the other one is stigma. And I think what's quite interesting is the stigma is, is multidimensional. It's at the individual level that is uh, provider stigma and general attitudes. That's one part of it. And then there is the organizational stigma in terms of how the stigma then translates at the organizational level and the need to change the culture um, within the settings in which the nurse practitioner folk are. And then the more harder one is the societal um, uh, stigma in terms of method clients. So these were some of the uh, barriers. Now, just uh, in terms of the clean, key learnings, just to bring everything together this these findings are not uncommon because when you listen to leanne adam and others here and sarah and others you will see that this is very much prevalent in other areas of eight or uh, aod specifically uh, in in a general sense but purely from the findings of this research uh, what we have learned from the qualitative interviews is nurse practitioner folk increase access to mate treatments, particularly for folks who live in regional and or rural areas. And I think the other important point to make here is they have unique and extensive professional experience and expertise. And they bring that because they have un and they have an ability to understand complex comorbidities, how they interact, potentially mental health and addiction, how do these conditions interact with each other and impact on a client, and also work with clients who not only have complex comorbidities, but also complex psychological social um, uh, psychosocial environments. Uh, the other part is they advocate actively against stigma and discrimination. Uh, regional and rural uh, area-based networks receive strong uh, support, uh, sorry, the nurse practitioners receive strong support from the parents. There needs to be more funded roles and recruitment to increase at, uh, attraction and retention. Uh, also, because we interviewed uh, privately practicing nurse practitioner folk, they most of them um, uh, uh, felt that they, they reduced the burdens on clients because of bulk billing, yet the remuneration via Medicare was insufficient. And it is, uh, um, I would like to flag here that this in this study happened before July 1st and before the changes which were released by the Commonwealth uh, government, just to point that out. And there is a dearth of literature in general on the contribution of specifically nurse method prescribing nurse practitioners um, in the literature itself. And then these recommendations for policy and practice, again, you will see a lot of um, um, synergy, medium to long-term long funding is required to improve both retention and also to attract nurse practitioners in regional and rural areas. Then additional resources and support staff goes back to the, question, the, the comments about high burnout, for example. Then increasing mate or prescribing 
capacity to ensure that when they go on leave or there are periods, then the clients receive continuous and ongoing care during this time. Then increase awareness and understanding of MATOR prescribing rules at the organizational level, and also need to conduct research that analyzes the efficacy and value of METOT service delivery in regional and rural areas provided by nurse practitioners, particularly through the lens of METOT clients. So I think these are some of the recommendations and I'm sure the panel will have a lot more to say um, uh, on, on this. So before I conclude, I would just uh, invite Yana to say something if I have missed something important or anything additional to add, and then we will jump to Colleen. Thank you, Tejasweeney. Um I think in the interest of time, I won't say too much. So my name is Jana Doslin. I worked with Teja Sweeney on this project and I come from a background in pharmacy and um, many years in the pharmacotherapy area-based network space. And I think um, from that lens, sort of from that um, lens of being in that pharmacotherapy area-based network space for so long, um, I got a sense that, that um through the re the recommendations really are arising from the recognition that MATOD accredited AOD nurse practitioners, they're a really important piece of the puzzle in this MATOD service system. And I think everyone here um, would agree with that. And we all know that. And we all know that the, the MATOD service system is growing more and more vulnerable each year. Um, and I think the, the recommendations also arise from the, the recognition that the nurse practitioners provide a very, very much a meaningful contribution to increasing MATOD prescribing capacity in rural, rural and regional Victoria. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that um, quite a number of them actually have fairly large cohorts of MATOD clients. So fairly medium, what would we what we would consider medium to large numbers of permits, MATOD permit numbers. So um, I got a sense that it wasn't just a few here and there, you know, five here, 10 there. Um, and that really, I felt that that was also contrary to what um, anecdotally might be the feeling out there in the field, that mm. they only, there are only a few nurse practitioners, that they only have a few, few clients. Um, but it's more than that. And we have 25 um, known MATOD accredited nurse practitioners in rural and regional Victoria alone, and a similar amount in, in the metropolitan regions. Um, so given though, and given that they are so active in the MATOD space, um, and they have that reasonably large, medium to large cohort. Um, so, you know, we had, we had, um, more than half of them with more than 50 MATOD clients, more than a third having 100 to 200 MATOD clients. Brett uh, Valance, who is on the panel today, having more than 200 clients. So really what that highlighted for me is that investment into this workforce really does impact a reasonably large um, group of consumers and, and plus consumers who are yet to access treatment um, and are in need of a MATOD prescriber. So I just wanted to add that, um, and in the interest of time, I'll hand back to Tej hand over back to Teja Sweeney, um, and I think we'll hear from Pauline as well. Thank the you. Floor is yours, Pauline. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so it's great to be sharing this research with you all today, and I think the power of it is in hearing the voice of the actual nurse practitioners themselves and their perspective of the service system and their place in it. So our PABIN Audicare has sought to increase the number of AOD MPs for a decade now, having commenced providing scholarships in 2015. 10 have been awarded so far and, and six are practicing, four are still studying. Um, we've been involved in several research projects to develop an evidence base to support the model and can see the real benefits for people living in regional and rural parts of our catchment in um, the in AOD MP service provision. I'm going to comment on three themes of the research and how the pattern with our 10 years of work building and supporting the pharmacotherapy service system, see these themes playing out in the field. I just want to be very clear, my observations are not findings or recommendations of the research itself. So the first uh, one is about theme one, the professional pathway to become an MP. 
So the research highlighted the various pathways that MP takes. And I wanted to acknowledge the le huge leap of faith that MPs took when commencing their studies. So often they commence their masters without a guaranteed MP position at the end. And this takes courage and optimism. And unfortunately, the reality is that having completed their qualification, some are not working as many hours as an MP as they might like to due to lack of funding of these positions. The second theme I wanted to address was uh, theme three and the impact on Maytel clients. The research, as Ted Sweeney has noted, provided insights to the challenges Maytel clients face in rural and regional areas, with the tyranny of distance being a massive, massive issue for many clients. Just to let you know, two instances in our catchment, we had a, a, a consumer travelling from Mildura to Gippsland to see a prescriber. We had another consumer travelling from Mildura to Swan Hill to see a prescriber on the bus. They fell asleep on the bus, ended up in Bendigo and did not get back, to, uh, had to catch the bus the next day. So huge access issues when enormous distances are involved. Um, from our experience, we know that NPs are embedded in the communities where they practice. They have often lived there for a long time and they are not transient. This is a, of significance in locations where we have acute GP shortage and, and significant GP movement. The final theme I wanted to address was professional barriers. The research highlights the dependence of some clinics, towns, and even entire regions on a single AOD NP. And a quote from the research was, the minute I get sick, which I try never to do, the whole system collapses. This is a significant system vulnerability and a situation which places enormous pressure on the NPs themselves. And this is not without consequence as the research also demonstrates. NPs are one, one very important part of the pharmacotherapy prescribing puzzle. We as PABINs will continue to work with GPs to encourage them to take on prescribing by incentives, supports, et cetera, because there is a, is a vulnerability in any system which sees a consolidation of permits amongst fewer prescribers. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Teja Sweeney. Thank you, Yana, for those fascinating insights. Now it's time to introduce the panelists. So if I can have the panelists with your cameras and your microphone, your camera's on and your microphone's on. And I'm gonna first of all introduce Leanne Bose. Leanne is the current CEO and immediate past president of the Australian College of Nurse Practitioners. Leanne, can you say hello? Hi everyone, thanks for having me today. Hello Leanne. And then up we have Sarah Lord. Sarah, Sarah needs no introduction, but for those who don't know her, she manages the Pharmacotherapy Advocacy, Mediation and Support Service, part of Harm Reduction Victoria. Sarah, say hello. Hi, thank you, Fergal. Pleased to be here. Hi, Sarah. And then Brett, Brett again, one of the one of the titans in uh, Ballarat. Um, so Brett has been working in the AOD field for 20 years and since 2017 has worked as an AOD nurse practitioner in Ballarat Community Health. Brett, can you say hello? Hello, everyone. And Titan's pretty loose term there, Fergal. Well, well <laughs> anyone who carries 200 permits, Titan in my book. And then we have Scott, Scott Drummond. Scott Drummond is the program manager at VADA, the peak body for AOD treatment services in Victoria. Scott, can you say hello? What's the opposite of Titan? That's where that's where I am. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. It's a you know, pleasure to be here and such a um, talented uh, group of attendees online too. So I feel really privileged. Thanks. Great. Great to have you here and look forward to your comments shortly. And then we have Adam Searby. Dr. Adam Searby, say hello. Hi, Fergal. Thanks for having me. And Dr. Adam Searby is the current president of DANA and has worked in uh, mental health and the AOD space for many years and is currently a research fellow at Deakin University, Melbourne. And then finally, we have Bonnie Rowe. Bonnie, can you say hello? Sure, can. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. So I beg your pardon, Bonnie Rowe. So Bonnie is the director of mental health and AOD strategy and policy at the Victorian Department of Health. 
having joined there in 2022. She, prior to that, was a director with Deloitte Access Economics Health and Social Policy team, having worked at Deloitte for 13 years. So I'm really excited to hear your particular thoughts, especially around the financial barriers to uh, nurse practitioners accessing the AOD space. So I want to thank the panel for their time and for joining us. Now, I have a number of questions that I'm going to ask the panelists, and then we'll open it up to the audience, depending on time. So this is a question for all. So have a think about this, and then I'll start picking on, on, picking on names. So uh, first of all, your initial comments on the key learnings from the research. What does that mean for MATOD treatment? So uh, if we go to Adam first, I saw you, your head move first, Adam, so that's why I'm going to pick on you. What are your initial thoughts? Uh, thanks, Burgle. Um, the one thing that stood out to me from Ted Jaswini's presentation was the comment about services not understanding nurse practitioners, because this is mm. certainly something we've noticed nationwide, really, with the work we've done with AOD nurse practitioners. Uh, services don't really understand AOD nurse practitioners, and I don't think this is a really broad statement, and it's probably not true for all services, but some don't see the value of AOD nurse practitioners. We know that lots of people, best intentions, go out and do the study, finish the study, and then have to wait a significant period of time for a job. And again, this has been nationwide. They have to write business cases for why they should have a job, almost prove themselves. So this kind of echoes what Ted Jaswini found. We found it nationwide as well. And look, we're nurses. We're out to treat and, and prescribe and provide holistic care, not write business cases. So it's not really in a lot of our skill sets. So I really think that there is a poor understanding of the role and that needs to be addressed before we can really infiltrate Maytod as such. Thank you, Adam. And what about Leanne? What are your initial thoughts? Uh, yeah, I've always got a few. Um, I'd have to agree with Adam. Um, and it's got me thinking too that, you know, um, over the last couple of years, but in particular the last few weeks, been having a lot of conversations about misconceptions as well about nurse practitioners. And it, it's absolutely true. They don't really understand what nurse practitioners do, but they also don't understand the breadth of what nurse practitioners do. Um, and tending to look at us as very task-based rather than as um, health professionals. So, you know, the fact that a nurse practitioner could prescribe MATOP um, is not the, the entirety by any means of what they are doing and what they can do and what they um, they will do uh, for people to help them to access healthcare and improve their health. So um, I'm, I've been doing a lot of work stressing that, yes, absolutely, a nurse practitioner can um, prescribe, um, can manage people, um, who use alcohol and other drugs, but they look at the whole person. They can do a lot more than issue that prescription, and they always do. They look at what other health problems are going on. They look at, um, and they don't do it all in isolation. There's this awful perception that's been around for a very long time that we just little cowboys that go off on our own and do our own thing and, um that's certainly not the case. We work very much as part of teams and we work together with other healthcare professionals. So I think agreeing with Adam that um, it's highlighted a very important point that people don't understand what nurse practitioners do. And some of that is around, you know, the fact that we often refer to ourselves as very specific types of nurse practitioners. And um, we should be able to do that. We should be able to say we're AOD NPs. I'm not, by the way, but um, we should be able to say that without them then taking that and going, well, that's all you can do. But the reality is a lot of people do that, that um, they, they think that well, that's the only thing you do because you're calling yourself that that's all you could do. But that's never the case with a nurse practitioner. Yeah. So I think we need more conversation around that as well. Thank you, Leanne. And over to you, Sarah, what would you say? Um, look, I think one of the, one, probably one of the biggest uh, learnings from the research that Tudor Sweeney's uh, presented, um, the remuneration issue is something that we keep coming up against time and 
time and again. Um, you know, nurse practitioners spend a lot more time with pharmacotherapy consumers because they have they have that time. The consults are longer, so there's more time to get to know the person, but the remuneration is not there, and that's that's such an ongoing problem. But I won't say any more just yet. As always. You won't shut me up, otherwise. <laughs> All right. And um, Brett, Brett Valence, what do you th- what do you say? Oh, well, I mean, I suppose uh, from my perspective, so the research just sort of reiterates what I think, <laughs> um, really. Um, I think, you know, as, as Leanne just touched on, yeah, certainly I probably want to see, but I was just nodding my head um, when we talk about um, we do a lot more than obviously just write a script for um, for methadone or, or administer an injection. So certainly, um, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, it's, probably frustratingly reassuring um, the research that's come out but um, yeah certainly something I mean and I'm very fortunate in the agency that I work in that um, I mean obviously I didn't, I didn't have to do a business plan but it's certainly something that I hear there's a lot of other NPs uh, around that sort of um, trying to justify reasons um, for, for doing the work which is uh, really really frustrating. Thank you, Brett. And Scott, what about you? Thank you, and congratulations to Jaswini and colleagues on the research. So uh, I was struck by the financial findings that the majority of um, Maytod prescribing nurse practitioners had received financial and other support, and the respondents who worked at the clinics had received financial support from other entities as well. Yet my sense, and, and other experts on the call will be able to add to this, my sense is that in other quarters, that's actually regarded, and it is, I think, regarded as, as actually quite a cost-effective uh, means of uh, accessing opioid substitution therapy, uh, Maytod. So there's what's missing here, that on the one hand, there is that need for the financial support to engage nurse practitioners, yet uh, it's regarded as, and it can be cost-effective, means of delivering this. And I guess I, I wonder about that question or that disconnect and I've got some thoughts I might share later on that and I might even go a bit rogue and apply a sociological lens to that but I'll uh, I'll leave that to later. Well you're in good company with a lot of sociologists here Scott and Bonnie I'd be particularly interested in your views on this especially around the financial aspects. Yeah sure well many things struck me about the research but coming from a strategy and policy background it was just nice to see many of the things that we hear anecdotally kind of formalized in evidence so that's certainly um, really important from a policy perspective Um, and in particular because we're commencing an ODT program review so the evidence is very timely uh, given the broader um, work afoot. Uh, The other thing that struck me was um, two things I guess it was just the resilience of the workforce and I'm always so inspired when I hear the stories from people working in the front line and kind of what drives them and attracts them to those roles. So I was particularly struck by that, um, as well as importantly, um, the resilience of people with lived experience as well and just really ensuring um, that um, their journeys and their experiences are really central um, to the work that we're doing. So those were the those are the two things. And yeah, of course, more broadly, the complexity of the incentive system and how that needs to factor into um, many of the decisions and the advice that we're putting forward, um, complicated by state and federal um, yeah, incentives and various other things. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Bonnie. Okay, so uh, the next question I'm gonna initially uh, pose to Leanne and Adam. Uh, so can you reflect on the on any current reforms and or changes that are being considered or that have been enacted to the nurse practitioner workforce in the state of Victoria and or nationally? And also I'd be particularly interested in your views if you have any around the idea of the uh, incentive uh, payments for GPs and how that might affect nurse practitioner uh, activity and also the, the changes in the pharmacotherapy prescribing in the community. So we'll go to Adam first. Can I defer to Leanne because I know she's all over this. And okay, we'll go to Leanne on. then. Leanne, <laughs> Goodness. let's hear your pearls of wisdom. <laughs> so, well, you all would be aware of the um, Nurse Practitioner Workforce Plan that was launched in May this year. Um, and what that is, is is kind of the overarching plan. Um, it's sort of the um, 
the the catch-all of all the barriers that we have in the country and of course it announced the um, removal of the collaborative arrangements which we all knew was coming anyway uh, by November next year but what that plan represents too is a national approach to dealing with the fact that we're a federated country and you know that in Victoria we do things slightly differently to New South Wales we do things almost completely differently to uh, WA. You know, there's differences, there's um, issues across the country between states and territories, and we're never going to fix that. We're a federated country. All we can do is try to have measures in place to, um, you know, try as much as we can to align things so that at least for us and for patients, it's a reasonably seamless transition. But unfortunately, there's still, as you would know, a number of issues and differences. So what the national plan hopes to do is to get the states to really take a look at how they're doing things. And hopefully, we hope in an ideal world, look at the best case scenario around the country and um, ask the others to try and try and um, come along and, and step up a little bit, hopefully. So um, while the Nurse Practitioner Workforce Plan is a federal document, it very much feeds into how the states and territories do things. So that's really important to know. Of course, Medicare and PBS are both federal um, and federal's the thing I can comment on the most. Um, and our prescribing rights sit with the states. Um, however, <laughs> there's there's interaction between those. So uh, with regard to PBS, um, we've had a major breakthrough in um, starting a broad sweeping review of PBS restrictions from the perspective of the patient, not from the perspective of the prescriber. So what we're looking at is from a patient's perspective, where are they disadvantaged because they see a nurse practitioner for their care? Where are they financially disadvantaged? So we're looking at it from that perspective. And soon the ACMP will actually be calling out for members to give us their list of where their patients are most disadvantaged. So that's a really good... And look, I'd have to say... The nurse practitioner workforce plan's existence is not necessarily yet directly impacting on processes like this, but it's perhaps giving a little bit more motivation to different departments and different layers of bureaucracy to go, oh, well, we're gonna get in, we're gonna be in the position where we're gonna have to do this really soon. So let's make a start because we know it's gonna be complicated. And the PBS process. Um, ACMP started arguing for quite a while ago. We had a major breakthrough last year and we kind of said, well, you know what, the workforce plan's coming, so let's get going. So that's how we're using that as a bit of a lever. Medicare's a lot more complex, as we all know. It's um, probably the most complex uh, thing that we will ever encounter as healthcare professionals, and I can't imagine how patients navigate it, but... Um, so the Strengthening Medicare Task Force is looking at major reform for, um, for MBS, which is very much needed. And that will not only, it's not a simple matter of just raising rebates because we know that doesn't work. We're raising nurse practitioner rebates next year by 30%. It's a Band-Aid. It's nothing more than a Band-Aid because it doesn't help our patients access the broader system. And it doesn't help sustain nurse practitioner services or connect us better with an ability to refer to allied health and things like that. It's just, but it'll be a helper. It will, there's no doubt, but it's a Band-Aid. And what's happening now is a review of all of the incentive programs, as Fergal mentioned. Um, and that's really important because at the moment, nurse practitioners are not a part of that. We're not any significant part of the incentive program. Now, one of the big Bs in my bonnet is it needs to be a primary care incentive program because if we make it continue it being a GP-specific program, basically leaving out the rest of primary care, we continue to leave out nurse practitioners. And we know that nurse practitioners 
do work very well in general practice and in an ideal world it would all work very well but the reality is there are and there always will be and there always should be nurse practitioner owned and led clinics as well in this country and um, we need to be a part of the system for us to be a part of the incentive system um, you know we need to be able to provide the same information on quality and safety in healthcare that GP clinics do through um, standards and an accreditation process. So that's something we've been working on for a number of years as well with the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. We now have standards and we have an accreditation process. All we need to do now, <laughs> and um, I laugh because it's not a small task, is link that process through to the incentive programs and the opportunity to do that will likely come as my Medicare is introduced. So we have to look at opportunities and levers. So I'm hoping that as my Medicare is introduced, and you know the federal minister's made an absolute commitment, public commitment for nurse practitioners um, and patients to be able to enrol with nurse practitioners under my Medicare. But what that means is nurse practitioners will be able to participate in the incentive programs once my Medicare is launched and our accreditation processes are linked. So it's all a very intricate web um, and it's all also occurring during major MBS reform and it may be the case that MBS looks completely different <laughs> in three or four years to what it does now but what's really important is that a patient can see who they need to see and access healthcare when and where they need it. And we need to design a system to facilitate that. So there's a lot of change coming. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like, but um, uh, all the Medicare um, committees I'm sitting on and all the um, things we're involved in, meetings we go to, are very much focused on people accessing healthcare. And I think that's um, something we all have in common around this table. But um, so, yeah, that, that's the Medicare incentive program is being reviewed right now, um, but also as a broader um, uh, part of my Medicare, which is the, the new, um, it, it's incentive linked uh, program for people to enrol with healthcare professionals. So, I hope that addresses the question a little bit. I could talk all day and it's <laughs> extraordinarily boring for some because a lot of it's policy and bureaucracy. Well, Leanne, it was absolutely fascinating. It's certainly not boring and it's really important and it's, it's really useful and interesting and hope, and hope inspiring to hear that actually the government is going to actually acknowledge the vital role that MPs play in primary care. And as you say, the incentive programme if it can be re refocused to primary care rather than GPs, that would certainly be a step forward. So thank you, Leanne, for your wisdom there. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask Bonnie and Scott the following question. Now, we all know that the Mental Health Royal Commission has uh, set out its findings and its aims. Part of its aims is to integrate the provision of AOD care into treatment as usual for mental health. So can you reflect on the reforms, changes to MATHOD service provision in Victoria that have occurred as a result of that, if any. So we'll go to Bonnie, first of all. Yep, sure, absolutely. I can speak to that and um, pass to Scott. So there's a myriad of change afoot across the mental health system um, and including ODT, which I'll talk to in a minute. Um, but in terms of integrated care, so that's reforms related to people with dual diagnosis. There's a rec recommendation 35 and 36 um, in the Royal Commission. And those relate to setting an expectation that mental health services support people with um, co-occurring needs. Um, and that includes not only when they access area mental health services, but in the new local mental health services that are being established now, some of which are opened, the next tranches of which has been announced as well. Um, so the expectation is that those mental health services as part of the reform um, ensure that they provide support for people with co-occurring needs. Um, some of those would be MATOD clients. Uh, there's also been the establishment of the Hamilton Centre. So that's a statewide service supporting people, um, supporting the system um, to uplift its integrated care capability. So I'd certainly encourage people to look up the Hamilton Centre and have a good understanding of the services which they um, are providing currently um, and noting that that will be expanded 
over time. So there's some of the key reforms as it relates to um, METOD clients. Specifically in AOD, though, we are undertaking an ODT program review, um, the, meeting, the first meeting of which was held recently. Um, I'll give you a bit of an overview of that program as well. Um, I think it's an uh, important one to note. Uh, so the government's committed to undertaking a longer term or medium to longer term review of the ODT service system because many of the problems that have been raised um, in the meeting today um, we're very familiar with and of course are looking to um, identify ways to resolve some of those long-standing issues. Uh, so there's this uh, programmatic review which has been undertaken um, that's really looking for what are some of those solutions drawing on the evidence and so that we can give advice to government around what some of the longer term solutions might be um, and we're undertaking this review um, in partnership with harm reduction Victoria and, and Sarah is involved in that as well so yes there's the mental health reforms which are really important to supporting people with dual diagnosis um, but we are undertaking some short term and then some medium to longer term um, work to ensure that this um, ODT service system itself um, is short up over time. Thank you. And uh, Brett? If I may, did you want me to go further? Oh. Sorry? Sorry, I beg your pardon, Scott. Oh, no worries. Thank you. And thanks, Bonnie. So, yeah, I'd say a couple of things, and I think it's an interesting question in relation to the Mental Health Royal Commission. So you uh, agreed, and we're clear that the uh, recommendations 35 and 36 clearly locate uh, the, and um, emphasise the importance of integrated AOD and mental health responses. So let's have a think about that. And the 50, up to 50 mental health and wellbeing locals plus area-based services and imagine now if all of those had the capacity and made the choice to uh, establish a, a, a METOD clinic, for example. But that's not, our fear is that's not going to be the reality. And it's not what we've seen to date in those that have been established. And I was just, as I was preparing for this last night, I had a look at the specs, in fact, of Tranche 2 for um, the mental health and wellbeing locals and the, the goals and the objectives of those. And they include better health outcomes and improved quality of life outcomes and recovery, such as improved physical health, contribution to decreased drug and alcohol use, addiction and harm, contribution to decreased engagement with the justice system. Now, it's clear to me, and if not everyone on this call, that an opioid substitution therapy program or agonist therapy program ticks all those boxes, yet it's not, and we, we, we're worried that those services aren't really going to embrace pharmacotherapy as they should. And I think one of the challenges here and issues here is that it appears that to date, most of the providers that have put their hands up to deliver the local um, mental health and wellbeing centres are mental health providers, whether that's MIND, uh, NEMI, uh, Wellways and so on. And I just don't think it's in their um, uh, line of sight exactly or their sort of skills, capacities, expertise and background to be thinking in those terms. And the specs didn't require uh, OAT exactly, but rather to, to deliver integrated care. And I kind of understand that because you want to do that in the context of local needs and priorities. So you leave it to your local services. But you've got, across those 50, you've got people, you've got services in Dandenong, Bendigo, Gippsland, Yarra Ranges, Mildura. You've got just this golden opportunity, and I just hope that's not wasted. I guess the other thing I would quickly sort of point to, really, is a broader sort of sociological lens, if I can go a little bit rogue, and that's around thinking about pharmacotherapy in Victoria as a field. Uh, and, and Bourdieu talks about this as a field where there are actors and agencies competing uh, for capital, social, economic and cultural capitals. And we've got this extraordinarily hegemonic um, structure in place that us as heretics on this call are trying to destabilise and actually um, uh, change the rules of the game. And that makes it very difficult. And I think unless we think in terms of some of the uh, power and orthodoxy that's in place and actually challenging those orthodoxies, uh, which come through to my mind in the mental health, in, in the way the mental health um, Royal Commission recommendations are being implemented, unless we think in those terms, 
it will remain a little bit of a challenge. And so I guess if I can offer one challenge to sort of Bonnie and Gary in terms of setting up and, and congratulations on the investment in the pharmacotherapy reform. And, and that's a really important initiative. But I think we need to think about the groups and the EOI. So I know there's an advisory group. There will be three uh, expert groups that sit below that, I think, in investment, developing investment strategy, developing a model of care, policy and regulatory adjustments for those working groups. Uh, I'd encourage folk to, when those EOIs come out, to you know, stack the stack the field and, and really see if you can't uh, get involved in those working groups to drive the change and um, challenge the orthodoxy that's been in place for so long. Thank you, Scott. Uh, th there's a question in the Q&A that I want to direct to Bonnie. Uh, you were referring to that committee, and the question is, are NPs on that committee, Bonnie? I will have to remind myself of the membership. I think I've just um, double check. Yeah. Yes, there, yes, there are. Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we do have representation now. That's fabulous. Okay. Um, so let's move on to to Brett. Brett, I'd like to uh, grill you a little bit, if I may. So first of all, what supports have you found valuable as an AOD NP working in the in the Matod space? You know, what what do you rely on? Um, so, I mean, I suppose first up is, is other NPs, um, and probably that started prior to me becoming an MP as well. So, obviously, um, sort of speaking with, with NPs in that area already um, to, um, you know, to sort of basically inspire me to, to move towards that. So, uh, but and, and in my current role, um, currently still um, heavily rely on, on other NPs. Um, so, uh, fortunate enough to have uh, an MP in a part-time role at our clinic as well, so um, which is really good. Um, addiction medicine specialist, so again, initially, um, when I first started, um, we had, uh, we were sort of linked, um, we saw Mike Madonna quite regularly and he was very supportive of the role and, and was tremendous um, in sort of looking after me as well, particularly <laughs> clinically when I first started. Uh, and now locally, um, Dr. Adam Straub's our addiction medicine specialist here in in uh, the Grampians region and situated in Ballarat, um, has a an, a, um, an opiate um, clinic running out of our community health centre on a Friday. So, so we have some great access to him. So, and he's again very um, accepting and and very open to to um, to us sort of contacting him, particularly when he's not at our clinic when he's, he's at the hospital. So, um, so he's great, but um, some other things, particularly around the support and the ongoing education, I mean, um, find that, that the, uh, the echo program that runs weekly um, out of St. Vincent's is, is a great source of information and education. Always learn something every week out of that, uh, either through the didactics or the presentations. Um, locally, our clinical network meetings that we have up here. So, sort of went online during COVID obviously, but but it's good to be back in the room with people and that that brings together the whole um, so we have, you know, pharmacists in those meetings as well. So which is um, so then to, to talk about our local pattern, so um, who organises those meetings and, and a lot of education stuff. Um, we've already touched on um, scholarship um, opportunities. Again, I was fortunate enough to receive some of that. Um, and then even um, the work that um, Pauline has done in our area around um, increasing nurse practitioner hours here as well, which has um, allowed me to go to full time um, and also introduction of, of my colleague as well, part time. So, um, yeah, so it's just uh, they're probably the main sort of ones I can think of. Yep. Mm, so, what I'm hearing then is it's all about networking and having relationships with other people and other experts and being able to access expertise that is absolutely crucial for your role. It is. Yeah. And certainly I'd say that, um, that's, it's important for, I believe for, for agencies um, uh, and, and the management within those agencies that are um, managing a nurse practitioner clinic is to just to ensure and allow uh, nurse practitioners to be able to do that. I mean, we, mm. we like the clinical work, certainly, but um, sort of to sit, you know, back-to-back -back clinic appointments 
five days a week really yeah. doesn't sort of allow that. So, but uh, so we need to be sort of ensure that the nurse practitioner has um, access to you know whether you know clinical supervision and, and just um, general sort of supports and those sort of things around the clinical clinical side of things yeah. and then and then the admin stuff as well so which can be very onerous yeah yep. so that's almost a say or rather it is a very useful segue into the next question that i wanted to ask you brett which is what do you think that organizations can do to optimize a, a, a np engagement in the aod space so you've touched on um, facilitating those those connections and you've touched on admin support are there any other processes or activities that you think that organizations should be doing to get NPs into AOD and maintaining them in the AOD space? Yeah, well, um, I mean, again, uh, I'm fortunate enough in, in the agency that, I, that I'm situated in, um, there's a, a pretty good understanding about what we do. So we don't sort of have to do a lot of that uh, within our own agency, but, um, but certainly for people to understand the role and, and what's available and and, and what can be done within within the clinic, um, and certainly, um, you know, I mean, probably one other big thing is is touching on the leave, um, and and for yes. an MP to be able to, to take some leave. So um, so whether it's you know based around um, you know you know providing coverage um, scripts and and having people that to possibly deputise for others while they take leave and administer it. Um, LAIB and, and those sort of things. So yeah, they're very important. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to ask the same question to Leanne and Adam. So Leanne, what do you think that organizations should do uh, to actually improve the, the, the supports for AOD and NPs? Well, I completely agree with Brett. We need to build the multidisciplinary team. You, you can't hang everything on one GP or one NP we need a team approach. We need to be able to take leave. We need to be able to, you know, um, have a day off. Um, but one of the issues um, I see in a lot of places with the nurse practitioner role specifically is we know in primary care financially it's very, very hard to make it work. We I, I completely acknowledge that. But in the public sector, um, Nurse practitioners are often put through very lengthy and extensive processes of having to put together business cases, justifying the need for them all, um, instead of um, looking at uh, com the community need and the patient need and the service delivery need. Um, we're often, and I know of quite a few NPs working in AOD in Victoria and around the country, to be fair, that have had to put together business cases just to establish their own role. And often while they're going through the study to become a nurse practitioner, at the same time, they're trying to put together business cases. And I know I'm also putting my educator hat on, having taught um, a lot of some of the ones here and, and many others that have gone through in the past, that they'll get to the end of their study and their business case will be deemed not good enough. And now there's no role for you. And um, I, I would like to ask if anybody knows of any other type of role where that sort of work is expected to that extent and where you're expected to undertake a two-year master's program at significant expense and time without the security of a job at the other end while trying to build a business case to justify yourself that's based on dollars which I understand, we all understand that the dollars have to work, but um, it's not based on service need or service delivery. And the business cases that we're being asked to prepare are not based on, you know, building of a multidisciplinary team, supporting the other team members that are already there. You know, if, if they've got a sole, um, uh, a, a doctor working on their own to um, provide um prescriptions and provide um, all the all the care around that um, you know they should be looking at building the service rather than having a nurse practitioner in isolation trying to develop a business case and I think we do that a lot to nurse practitioners we do that a lot to nurse practitioner students and um, in particular in particular I'm sad to say 
I see it very, very commonly in AOD. Very, very commonly. Yeah. In, in more so than so, in some other areas. So I, I just want to know, does anybody know of anywhere else that this happens? Because um, it's been a particular bugbear of mine. Um, we don't seem to put other health professionals through this degree of, of pain. So, Adam, what would you say to that? Oh, it, it is very unusual. And I'll get right back to what I said first. This seems to be really common everywhere that you go and do this study and then you're kind of left hanging. And I know there's people on this call who have been in this exact situation and we've talked about it. So, yeah, as you say, Leanne, it is bizarre and who knows? I know there's people that have walked away from it as well. But I just wanted to kind of come back 10 steps to Angela's comment in the chat about succession planning because we're talking about attracting AOD NPs, but I think we need to come back to attracting nurses to AOD full stop. I know it's a problem across yeah. all medicine, allied health, that this is the unsexy specialty, so to speak. There's a lot of stigma towards our consumers of these services, but there's also stigma towards nurses that work in them, you know? It's not real nursing. Mm -hmm. We're lazy, not good enough to work somewhere like intensive care. So I think we need to come back and address that and go with that whole idea that you can't be what you can't see. We don't have nurses working their way through, becoming really experienced and going, oh, hang on, I've seen this nurse practitioner who I kind of aspire to be like, who can mentor me. I think we're in a whole lot of trouble personally. And I don't just think that's Victoria. I think it's probably across the country. How do you think, going on the theme of, of organisational advocacy, how do you think that we should be advocating for nurse practitioners, especially in the primary care space where there is this, it's, it's fundamentally un, financially unviable for a nurse practitioner to work in primary care without additional financial support. So how, how do we change that and how do we advocate for that change? It just feels like, to me anyway, I don't know, other people's experiences might be different. The biggest argument is economic. That seems to be where you get the biggest kind of uh, buy-in when you talk to people. I mean, we talk about this idea of holistic care, but I don't think anyone's actually defined it in terms of an AOD nurse practitioner and what that actually means, because the nurse practitioners in this room will know exactly what it means, but I'm not sure that anyone's set out to kind of get a consensus definition on it. But we know that... We're doing more than just writing scripts, mental health, physical health, psychosocial issues. And we've actually got the luxury, I suppose, to spend a bit of time with people. So that's probably a two-pronged argument in that respect. I noticed Ed put in the chat before that we need to kind of hammer home the holistic aspect. And I think that's where it sits. But there's also an argument that it's a very smart investment for limited health yeah. funds. And I want to go to Scott because he made that point earlier that it is a smart investment. Scott, what do you think uh, organisations should be doing to advocate for the financial support for um, MPs? I'd probably almost broaden it out a, li a little bit. I think that's to, to do it more at scale. I think organisations, isolated organisations or consortia here and there advocating can only achieve so much and probably only just for their organisation individually or their, their particular consortia. I think we're entering, and Bonnie might be able to talk about this, entering a really challenging uh, fiscal period, uh, which is a worry for, for, for us in terms of government spending. But I think a, a, a greater sort of more coordinated campaign with some clear, realistic, achievable objectives, sector-driven uh, from uh, nurse practitioners through organisations, clinicians and others, driving that agenda forward that's uh, quite well organised rather than isolated would be would be one comment I would make. Mm. And moving on to Bonnie, what would you say? Oh, well, yes, building on that point, Scott. So, I mean, business cases, it's the season for them at the minute in the fiscal environment is absolutely very tight. So when this talk of business cases is going on, of course, that's a little bit different in our context. Um, I mean, 
we're just going to make sure that we're undertaking the work and providing evidence to government for its consideration um, to justify you know, sound investment um, relative to all the other things that government has to consider with the funding available. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of just riffing off of what Scott said. It's that all these discussions and um, nurse practitioners and the value that they deliver, the evidence is absolutely necessary as we put the case to government um, for investment, um, noting that there's, you know, often a range of interventions that we have to provide cases for and they need to stack up um, relative to the other options available to government at that time. Thank you, Bonnie. Now it's time to correct a great wrong. We haven't heard the voice of Sarah Lloyd recently. So Sarah, get your thinking hat on. Um, I wanna talk about the consumer perspective and all of this, because at the end of the day, we're all aware that nurse practitioners need support to provide holistic care to consumers. So what do you think from a consumer perspective, what do you think are some of the challenges for consumers in seeking Matod? And then what are the solutions? So what are the challenges and what are the uh, solutions? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Fugle. I've got my co one of the star PAMS co-workers, Jimmy, here with me. So Jimmy may Hi, Jimmy. feel free to butt in. Um, yeah, thanks, Regal. Look, I think um, it's different for people who are accessing treatment for the for the very first time as opposed to people who are starting or, or restarting treatment, and it's very different depending on where you live, whether you're based in the rural regional area or if you're in the metro, metro area. We also find it, uh, it really matters in terms of whether you've got access to private transport or you're relying on um, public transport. So, I mean, things like finding a, a really good prescriber that's accessible has become increasingly difficult, particularly over the last five to 10 years, particularly a, who, uh, a prescriber who is, is offering the type of treatment that you're uh, wanting um, that you can access an appointment in a sort of a timely a timely manner. Um, ideally, a situation where the, the permit can be uh, approved relatively quickly so that ideally you can get a, a script or a long-acting injectable buprenorphine as, as close as possible to that uh, first appointment. Um, we're also finding uh, that people are reporting to us they're having more difficulty finding a prescriber who will start or restart them on methadone if that's the treatment type that, uh, that they're wanting. And I guess the other thing is, particularly for people who are starting treatment for the first time, access to really good, comprehensive, easy to understand sort of peer-focused resources on the different types of treatment that are available, how they work, what's different about them, um, getting support to, to really be able to consider what's going to work for you. You know, so many of us know it's the, the right treatment, the right time, the right person delivered at the right dose in the right way by the right people. And that That's the sort of stuff that works. But there's a, a lot of rights in there that, you know, you need to kind of get right. Um, and of course, the other thing is that stigma and discrimination is is woven all through this. I think particularly people who are accessing treatment for the for the first time, if there's any other option to keep going the way that you are, a lot of people will continue continue that, be it sourcing, you know, opioids through the illicit market, or um, possibly, you know, somebody is prescribed opioids by uh, a GP and the GP said, look, really, I think it's dependence rather than chronic pain. I'm not happy to continu continue prescribing this for you. You're going to have to seek treatment. Um, and, and I guess in that sort of very scenario, we find people who have been seeing a GP prescribed as a opioid analgesics for the management of, of chronic pain. And in, in some cases, people have been prescribed um, these sorts of opioids for many, many years, 10 years more in some cases, and then dependence becomes the issue rather than the management of chronic pain, and then all of a sudden you've got to go and see someone else. You know, why? That that very same person, be it a GP or, uh, you know, can can actually prescribe suboxone. So there's there's lots of, lots of difficulties um, accessing treatment. I think one of the things that I was thinking earlier I don't know if people remember that um, sort of promo, nice people take drugs that was around quite a, 
quite a few years ago, showing my age. We almost need something like, you know, awesome people access treatment for opioid dependence and a campaign around that possibly to, to address some of the stigma and discrimination because people really feel fear that. And they fear being able to be honest and what the repercussions of being honest might mean, might have, might mean for them, for their family, um, and and for their treatment moving forward. So I think there these are these are some of the uh, the, the the challenges. I guess I think obviously we need more prescribers. Um, I think a lot of the work that that we do at at PAMS tries to support the work that prescribers are doing, be they GPs or NPs. We work with a lot of nurse practitioners right across um, Victoria and generally, you know, like consumers say to us that they really, you know, um, benefit greatly from the work that nurse practitioners have been doing. I think just the simple fact that a nurse practitioner has got more time to spend in a consultation, as I was alluding to earlier, with a consumer, that having that time to just talk I think is of huge benefit to the consumer and, and hopefully to the, the prescriber as well because you get that chance to you know exchange information and, and, and that sort of thing and find out what's happening for the person and I think so much of this is about being able to see people as individuals and um, find the treatment that and, and fit it into a person's life in the way that it's going to work for that person rather than saying, this is what I'm allowed to do, this is the policy, this is it, that's what you'll get. You know, that's where we end up with sort of blanket rules and what that tends to really do is, I guess, sort of exclude people from treatment. We we need to to, to make treatment as, as accessible and as malleable as possible so that it can really work for a, an individual and and that is a challenge it is it is more difficult rather than to say that's what it is that's what's happening take it or leave it see you later and and I think sometimes the the worry is that people feel that there is only one option um so definitely you know um more more prescribers but I think we'll get more prescribers by chipping away at the at the immense amount of stigma against this uh, consumer group. Thank you, Sarah. I, I love that word malleable. And I'm very <laughs> pleased to see that, that within this audience, we do have representatives from the Department of Health. So take on that, take on board that word malleable prescribing. There is a role for it. But if I could summarize what you've just said, Sarah, really, we're talking about integrating, um, you know, treatment for opioid dependence into, into Care as usual, business as usual, and it, and it is an, an injustice almost to say that now that you've, okay, I've looked after you for 20 years for your chronic pain, but now that you've, I've given you this diagnosis on a dependency, it's time for you to seek help elsewhere. I mean, that's just, you know, on a, on a human level, that's just not fair. Yeah. yeah. So you, you talked about, the other thing you talked about was expansion. So we need more prescribers. So I'll ask this question of you first, and then I'll put it to the rest of the panel. What do you think we can do to increase AOD nurse practitioner numbers? How do we improve and increase the footprint of AOD NPs within MATOD? Sarah, what would you say to that first? And then, then I'll ask the same question of all of the panelists. Look, I really think it's a lot of things. I don't think it's just one thing that will work. I think, mm. I think, I think funding more more positions is uh, is huge, but I'm also acutely aware it takes a really long time to to call to become a fully qualified nurse practitioner. Um, but I mean, it also takes a substantial amount of time to become a general practitioner, and um, you know, more to become an addiction medicine specialist. So. Um, I think it's great that there has been um, scholarship money, say, for example, through the pharmacotherapy area-based networks, which have assisted nurses to to get the qualifications. Um, I mean, wouldn't it be great if every single community health service had a nurse practitioner who was a prescriber and not only one but two, so there would be backup for when, you know, if anybody was away sick or wanted to take leave rather than the person having to ring PAMS and then us having to ring the clinic and just 
beg and hope that we can find someone to deputise. Mm. Like it's there, it's in the guidelines, it's totally legal. We're not asking the world, just continue the script, you know, that sort of thing. I mm. think the pressure that that puts on, on on nurse practitioners, I know the feeling, guys, like not being able to take a day off. I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, right. look, I think it's, it's building a sustainable system, I'm, I've got a lot of hope um, on the reforms that the um, Department of Health and um, Harm Reduction Victoria are working with the, the sector on it at the moment. That's um, really, really, really exciting, and I hope that something really good can come out of that. But, yeah, more funding, more, right. more support. I told you you'd have to shut so Sarah. Thank, yeah, thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate your wisdom. Um, no, we, we are running out of time. So very briefly, I'm going to go through the panellists. How do we improve the AOD and NP footprint in Matod? Adam, how do we do that? I'll go back again and say you need to start right at the bottom at the nurses going through university and actually teach them that this is a viable specialty. Without that sustainability mm -hmm. pipeline, I just don't think it's it's going to happen that we can have numbers to make sure that we're a successful b we can scale up and see sustainable all right and leanne totally very agree. quickly we've got to give those nurses the aspiration to to do it and at the other end um advanced practice nurses will become nurse practitioners and work in this area if the role is made possible if the role can work the biggest blocker for us is that we can't deliver health care to people who need it without barriers unnecessary barriers are very frustrating very off-putting advanced practice nurses are not becoming nurse practitioners they're just transitioning to you know other roles and uh, we're missing mm. so many opportunities Okay, and uh, Brett, what would you say? Oh, look, uh, yeah, probably just to uh, reconfirm what everyone else has sort of said. But again, uh, it's really interesting. We have uh, through the health centre here, we have nursing students that roll through, and I make sure that we sort of we get a a day with them to sit in NP clinic here. So and it's uh, mm. yeah, it's really interesting just to hear sort of. Um, what they know before we start the day and then what they think at the end of the day. It's a bit of a whirlwind of a day, but, um, yeah, just to try and <laughs> certainly get it as an undergraduate. Yeah. Yep. So it's exposure there. early on then. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And Scott, Scott, what would you say? I'd, I'd like to see a short, medium and longer term strategy coming out of the reform agenda that includes a whole range of elements, model of care, workforce, funding, training, education, you know, some of the things that uh, some of the key components of a effective functioning um, method system in Victoria. And uh, Bonnie? Well, at the risk of just saying what everyone else said, um, I thought I'd take a somewhat of a different path, but I think everyone in this call has um, a role to play in that, whether it's as advocates and having conversations such as these or talking to your peers. I think we all have a role to play in breaking down stigma, which of course impacts um, on the performance of the system. But in terms of what I can do professionally, I think it's, you know, coming to things such as this and hearing the evidence and really making a case to government about why establishing a really sustainable um, pharmacotherapy system in Victoria is important and that it's an attractive place for people to come and work, including nurse practitioners. So yeah, I think my role is really around ensuring the system is sustainable um, and that it's an attractive um, place for the, the workforce to come and work and support people um, to break down some of the access barriers we've talked to earlier. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, so it's now time for me to hand over to Adam for a discussion on the next step. Next step. So Adam, I'm looking forward to your pearls of wisdom. Over to you. My pearls of wisdom on the next steps. Uh, well, I will say that nationally, at Dana, we're fiercely advocating for increased take up of not only nurse practitioner led models of care, but nurse led models of care. So we'll keep doing that and keep advocating to people but I've always inspired coming to these meetings by the nurse practitioners I've done a work work with few in Victoria who are doing some amazing things so I think it's a really exciting time and we're kind of moving in a really nice direction and we'll keep flying the flag for you okay well look uh we're gonna have to draw this fast Leading discussion to a close but I want to say that it's really apparent to me and I think it should be apparent to everyone that really the crucial role that nurse practitioners play 
in a in a service that is that uh, one of the panelists, I think Bonnie said, was vulnerable. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge that that being highlighted. And we also hope that um, where nurse practitioners are adequately utilized and supported and remunerated, consumers will have better access to MATOD. And at the end of the day, that's why we are all here. We're all here to advocate for improved service delivery to consumers. And that includes in rural and regional areas. So thanks to our speakers and our panel members for your insights today. Teja Sweeney, thanks very much for this, uh, this mammoth effort and for presenting this research. Thank you, Pauline, for funding it. And thank you for Monash University. And I can see Aaron in the bottom right of my corner. Thank you for being part, part of the organization that actually funded this research. I, I'm very optimistic that this is actually going to facilitate change, uh, picking up on comments from Bonnie. I want to thank the audience for your interest and participation in today's forum. I, I apologize that I haven't been able to get through to all of the questions and all of the comments, but it's been such a rich discussion. Uh, really, the only solution to that is A, we need more time, or B, we need to do it all again. Now, we will disseminate the main points uh, of today's discussion via email, as well as the project report. You've all registered with an email address. We will use that for you. Everyone, I want to thank you. It's been a fascinating discussion and uh, have a great rest of morning and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, panel. Thanks so much. Thanks, Fergal, for, um, for facilitating and being such a great supporter as well. Really appreciate you. Thanks, Pauline. Thank Thanks, Yana. Thanks, Ted Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Virgil.